This is the Vector Heat Method by Nicholas Sharp, Yusuf Soliman, and Keenan Crane, as presented at SIGGRAPH 2019. This work presents a brand new algorithm for computing the parallel transport of a vector along shortest geodesics via heat flow. We call our scheme the Vector Heat Method. Our key insight is that when you diffuse a vector field in the right way, the angles of the diffused vectors will be exactly the desired parallel transport. Before this work, the only way to compute parallel transport was to actually construct geodesic paths from the source to each point and carry vectors along these paths, which is very expensive. The amazing thing about the vector heat method is that we can compute the same quantity without actually constructing any geodesic paths. As a result, it's an order of magnitude or more faster and much simpler too. In addition to being super fast, the vector heat method yields globally accurate parallel transport, which allows us to build other applications on top of it. And it also applies to a very broad set of inputs. We've taken a fundamental operation from differential geometry and exposed it for the first time as a tool in geometric computing. And with this new tool, we can do a lot of new things. We can efficiently perform nearest neighbor interpolation on general geometric domains, extend velocities and level set problems, and compute the logarithmic or exponential map, evaluate averages on surfaces, and build centroidal Voronoi diagrams on curved domains. For many of these problems, our approach is the first to yield globally accurate solutions, because it follows from a globally accurate notion of parallel transport. Some very related prior work is the heat method for geodesic distance, which used short time heat flow to compute distance along surfaces. Here in the vector heat method, we're computing parallel transport rather than distances, but the basic insight is the same, using short time heat flow to compute a difficult geometric quantity. We also inherit many of the strengths of the heat method for distance, which I mentioned before. Our scheme is fast, globally ac accurate, and broadly applicable. You see, parallel transport is a special challenge that arises when working with vectors on surfaces. In the plane, it's easy to move a vector between different locations. You simply translate it. On surfaces, however, it's not so obvious how to transport a vector to a distant location. We'll compute parallel transport along geodesics. In the plane, this amounts to exactly what you're already used to. If we draw a straight line between two points, the vector makes the same angle against the start and end of that line. And on surfaces, this definition still works. If we draw the shortest geodesic path between two points, the parallel transport of a vector makes the same angle against the path at the start and end points. This definition is useful, natural, and widely used. But we're going to do this without actually constructing geodesics. The key insight that makes everything possible is that for a very natural notion of vector diffusion, the direction of vectors after short time diffusion will be the parallel transport along shortest geodesics. This fact has long been known in differential geometry, but hasn't seen much use in geometry processing. Starting with this new insight will allow us to do fundamentally new and different things. So how do we put this op observation to work to transport vectors around a surface and build an algorithm? We'll start by talking about a simpler scalar diffusion problem and then introduce the full vector diffusion problem and use it to build our vector heat method. Then we'll talk about a few different ways to discretize the algorithm as well as some applications of the scheme. So to warm up, let's talk about scalar heat flow. Here, a distribution phi gets diffused over time, evolving according to the action of its Laplacian. As we see on the bottom, an initial point gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier as time proceeds. We can actually use this behavior to extend data. Suppose we have values defined at two isolated points, like I've shown here. We then diffuse these values for some amount of time to get the distribution shown in green. Then we take the indicator function at the sources, which is just the value one at each point, and diffuse it in the same way to get this orange distribution. Dividing these two distributions by one another yields an extension of the values to the whole domain. And amazingly, as you do this with shorter and shorter time heat flow, the result of the process corresponds to a nearest neighbor extension of the data. In the lower rightmost frame here, we see that the solution crisps up to take the value from the nearest source point. This is actually a really practical and useful algorithm. It works out of the box on curved domains where a nearest neighbor becomes nearest in the sense of geodesic distance. Here we're using the scheme to extend data from point sources as well as data defined along a curve. Cool, so what about vectors? Well, vector diffusion works in exactly the same way, except that we need to use this connection Laplacian, which is just like a Laplacian, except it knows how to keep vectors parallel as they diffuse. As we see on the bottom, an initial vector source gets smeared out and smeared out and smeared out over time by the action of this diffusion. 
This diffusion turns out to have a pretty remarkable, pro remarkable property, which is the core of our technique. If you dig up the heat kernel expansion for the connection Laplacian, it's got a lot going on. But all these terms only affect the magnitude of the result, while the direction is entirely determined by these terms. And over a short time, it turns out that the dominant contribution to the direction is exactly the parallel transport. This means that vector diffusion can give us parallel transport. All we need to do is sort out the vector magnitudes. And with the vector heat method, we do exactly that. Given isolated vector sources, we first diffuse them according to vector heat flow, resulting in this smeared out field. Then we take their magnitudes and extend those magnitudes according to the same scalar scheme I just described. We then scale the field from the first step to have these extended magnitudes. This yields the vector field on the right, which is amazingly the parallel transport along shortest geodesics from the nearest source point. We dub this process the vector heat method. Notice that if you're transporting a single vector, you could skip this bottom step and just normalize. But in general, the bottom step really is necessary to get the magnitudes right. So that's it. The vector heat method amounts to four steps. First, diffuse your input vectors, then diffuse their magnitudes, and diffuse an indicator function at the source locations. And finally, combine the results. These first three steps are all linear. This means that fast and effective linear solvers can do the computational heavy lifting. And the last step is just some local arithmetic. Here are some examples of applying this scheme on curved surfaces. On the left, we parallel transport vectors from the three points, circled in red. And on the right, we transport vectors defined along a curve. At the high level, this is really remarkable. It may seem simple, but we can compute parallel transport along shortest geodesic paths without ever actually computing the geodesic paths. Now that we understand the formulation in terms of continuous mathematics, let's walk through how to express it as a discrete algorithm. To solve vector valued diffusion problems, we'll need to work with tangent vectors in our linear systems. Here, each tangent vector is defined in a little arbitrarily chosen basis at each node. As a notational convenience, we'll represent 2D vectors as complex numbers. And then a 2D rotation is just a multiplication by a unit complex number. One very important quantity will be the change of basis between adjacent tangent spaces. This will play the role of a connection from differential geometry. We first discussed a, a simple scalar heat flow problem, which will require a discrete Laplace operator. This is just a sparse V by V matrix where the off diagonals hold a weight for each edge between nodes and the diagonals hold the negative sum of these weights. Now, to evaluate our vector heat flow, we'll similarly need a connection Laplace operator. This is again just a V by V sparse matrix, except that it's complex valued because it processes tangent vectors rather than scalar values. Similar to the scalar case, this matrix has off diagonal elements, which are the same weights as before between adjacent nodes, except that here we also need to incorporate the change of basis or connection Rij. The diagonal elements are still just a sum of weights. That's all it takes to make a connection Laplacian. With either of these operators, we can now evaluate heat flow via a single backward Euler time step, which amounts to just solving Ax equals b. Notice that all we needed here was a set of edge weights for the Laplace operator and a connection which rotates vectors between adjacent tangent spaces. These are easily available on a wide range of domains. We've already implemented the vector heat method on triangle meshes, point clouds, polygonal meshes, and voxelizations. With these discrete building blocks, we can really be concrete about one possible way to implement the vector heat method. First, build the Laplace matrices described previously, the connection Laplacian and the ordinary scalar Laplacian, then prepare the corresponding time step systems for vector heat flow and scalar heat flow. Then for any input data, we build initial conditions, which are the input vectors, the magnitudes of the input vectors, and indicator functions at the input locations. Then we solve linear systems to evaluate the three heat flow problems, one vector heat flow and two scalar heat flows. Finally, we combine these results to scale the vectors at each node and yield the, yield the output result. The kind of amazing thing here is that for any new source data, we just need to repeat these last three steps, even if the source locations are changing. Because these are prefactored linear systems and pointwise operations, this ends up being super fast. Here's an example where I've shown the parallel transport of a source vector located on the fane across this entire model, as well as some more examples of parallel transport, where in each case we're transporting a single vector across the entire domain using our scheme. Of course, to implement the algorithm in practice, one must pick a time for the short time heat flow. The good news is that here, 
The same result applies as from the heat method for geodesic distance. Simply set t equals to h squared, where h is the mean spacing between nodes. We performed some additional experiments on a database of models and confirmed that this is really consistently a good choice in practice. Here, each line represents a model, and we swept through different choices of the short time t. We see that t equals squared is consistently near the optimal choice and is never a bad choice for any of the models. To give some more practical numbers about runtime performance, remember that the main burden here is performing three sparse linear solves to evaluate the vector heat method. But the good news is that these solves can be prefactored, even if your, the location of your source set is changing. On a 100,000 face mesh, this amounts to being about 7 tenths of a second of pre-compute and about 30 milliseconds per solve afterwards. This was on a single core of an i7 CPU using sweet sparse for linear solves. We validated our algorithm on a torus, where an exact solution to parallel transport is known, and observed linear convergence with piecewise linear elements on a triangle mesh. Our algorithm, algorithm is already quite robust, but on very poor quality meshes, you might still observe flipped vectors due to negative weights in the Laplace operator. We designed an improved version of intrinsic Delaunay flips augmented with tangent data to represent vector valued problems, which turns out to completely eliminate this issue. In fact, this idea proved so effective that we wrote a whole other paper on it, which you should go check out if you're interested. Let's look at some applications of the vector heat method. Here are the applications I'll talk about today, which is just a glimpse of what you can do. First, we'll look at velocity extrapolation, such as in level set problems, and then we'll see how the vector heat method can be used to compute the logarithmic map. This in turn leads to efficient and effective algorithms for computing averages on surfaces and evaluate evaluating centroidal Voronoi diagrams. So let's start out with velocity extrapolation. A common operation when working with sine distance functions and level set simulations is to compute some update velocity at a level set and then extend that update across the entire domain. The vector heat method turns out to be perfectly suited for this operation. If you just want the normal component of your velocity, you can extend it using our scalar interpolation scheme, while the full vector heat method can transport all the components of a vector. This works on both flat and curved domains, and all the relevant matrices can be prefactored, even as the interface location is moving. Our transport along shortest geodesics turns out to be exactly the quantity you want in this case, and you can get it cheaply and globally, not just in a narrow band. In our experiments, these updates preserved sine distance functions across hundreds of iterations of a simulation without any redistancing. Moving on, the exponential map is a basic concept from differential geometry. For any point x on the surface, the exponential map takes a vector in the tangent space of that point and walks in that direction and distance along the surface, returning the resulting point on the surface, which you see here on the left. The logarithmic map is just the inverse of the exponential map. With respect to a given source, for each point on the surface, it holds the direction and distance to walk from the source to get to that point. Unfortunately, some past work in computer graphics has interchanged these terms. The latter quantity is really the logarithmic map. So this logarithmic map is then a very special 2D parameterization defined with respect to a given point on a surface. And in fact, the vector heat method will give us all the ingredients we need to compute this map. I'll tell you how. First, we take vectors pointing outward in a small epsilon ball around the, about a source and parallel trans them, transport them using the vector heat method to get a radial field. Then we take a single vector defined at the source and parallel transport it to get a horizontal field. Measuring the angles between these two fields will give the polar component of the logarithmic map, and integrating the radial field will give the magnitude of the logarithmic map, which is just the distance from the source. Great. And once again, because the vector heat method is so general, this procedure can be immediately applied on many different geometric domains. For instance, here we compute a logarithmic map on a point cloud. On triangle meshes, a few different methods for computing this logarithmic map has been put forth over the years, but these schemes were designed for decaling, so they were only locally accurate. You can see here that the first three schemes on the bottom all have significant errors compared to the reference solution. In contrast, our logarithmic map is rooted in a globally accurate notion of parallel transport, so you can see that we very closely match the reference solution everywhere on the domain. Some very recent concurrent work by Herholtz and Alexa actually does make use of short time heat flow to compute a logarithmic map. And they also demonstrate localized solvers for fast performance. 
But unfortunately, since they don't have parallel transport, they end up approximating a numerical derivative, which comes with its own set of pitfalls. But the vector heat method gives us a fast, numerically stable, and globally accurate log map. And it turns out that this global accuracy allows us to build a lot of other applications on top of it. To get some intuition for why this log map is so useful, notice that it's an xy coordinate frame which properly represents geodesic distance from a source location. This makes it very useful for expressing algorithms involving geodesic distances. One great example of which is computing averages on surfaces. Given a collection of marked points, we seek a center of those points. As in Euclidean space, one can compute means or medians, which are known as Karsher means or Frechet means and geometric medians, respectively. For both, there's actually a very simple algorithm going back to the 1940s for computing centers called Weitzfeld iterations, which basically amounts to alternating evaluation of the logarithmic map and exponential map. Now that we have a good log map, computing centers on surfaces is easy. Here's a simple example where we compute the center of the five square orange points. Our estimate is the purple trajectory, which quickly converges to the right answer. On simple shapes, two to five iterations is usually sufficient to find a mean with this procedure. On more complex instances, we still see convergence in less than 20 Weitzfeld iterations. We can also find the centers of distributions, as shown here in red, at no additional cost with this procedure. In this figure, we also demonstrate means as well as medians. On surfaces, computing a geometric median contributes additional robustness, just like it does in Rn. This is really something you couldn't do with previous log map algorithms because they weren't globally accurate. Using Weitzfeld iterations with the three prior log maps just wanders randomly around the surface. Another prior approach on surfaces by Pinozzo et al. fails to output the correct answer because it depends on a high dimensional embedding which can't accurately capture this complex input shape. Our approach quickly converges to the center of the marked points and takes just a few seconds because it's ultimately rooted in a globally accurate and efficient notion of parallel transport. Similar machinery allows the vector heat method to compute centroidal Voronoi diagrams. Here, scalar extension labels our cells, and our averaging procedure finds the centers of those cells. Unlike many approximate methods common in geometry processing, the scheme properly handles large diagrams in general topology, and it really yields a geodesic centroidal Voronoi diagram. Taking a step back, I've talked mainly about ordinary tangent vectors but the vector heat method actually applies generally to any vector bundle and choice of connection on a Riemannian manifold. In the paper, we experimented with symmetric direction fields, with one forms, and with different choices of the connection. Looking forward, there's a lot of things still to do with the vector heat method. We've exposed a new fundamental quantity from differential geometry, and given a, given a scheme to compute it, which is fast and easy to implement. Our method applies to a very broad set of geometric domain and turns out to have a lot of great applications. Here's a few hints of what's coming next. One downside is that because the vector heap method uses global PDEs, each solve still costs at least O of n, even if you're only interested in the solution in a small region. We'd like to leverage recent work on localized solvers to cheaply get solutions in small areas. More broadly, we only made naive use of direct solvers in this work and big performance gains could be had with parallel, iterative, and hierarchical solvers. We're well positioned here to leverage advances from scientific computing because all we need to do is solve a few linear PDEs. The core theory behind the vector heat method is extremely general, but we applied it only to surfaces in this work. We'd like to explore more implementations, in particular applying it to volumes. We've got a nice implementation of this project available online, including some of the applications mentioned here. Go check it out and let us know what you think. As a closing thought, this is the second algorithm we've seen where short time heat flow is used to compute a difficult geometric quantity. We're optimistic that there are more heat methods out there yet to be discovered. With that, I'll thank you for your time.